Within a few years, I began to encounter the same ideology of positive thinking being applied to people who were downsized from the corporate world, white-collar, middle-level people, being sent to um, support groups or networking groups. There are all kinds of names for these things where the message was, hey, it's not bad to be laid off. It's actually a good thing. Uh, it's actually an opportunity. It's a growth opportunity, and you will come out of it much better. And if you want to come out of it at all, of course, you better work on your attitude because the key to getting a job in today's corporate world is not knowing things or having skills or experience, but having a positive attitude. Somebody who's in a, an absolute low point in their lives, and certainly losing a job can be that, and just tell them, it's nothing wrong. You know, just put, you know, put on a smiley face and get on with it. and Don't complain, whatever you do. So then I, be, I, I began to see a pattern and find it in more and more aspects of um, American life, uh, this kind of mandatory optimism and cheerfulness. One area where it is very strongly concentrated now and has been for some years is the corporate world, the workplace, where the idea has been, yes, indeed, you better be positive because you're not really there to do X or Y tasks. You're there to spread good cheer and make the other people around you comfortable and happy all, all day. Now, you might think, what's wrong with that? I mean, certainly many people have asked me, well, all right, so it's delusional to think everything is okay or to go to the real delusional extreme. You know, embedded in all this is the idea that you change the physical world with your thoughts. When you send thoughts out from your mind, they exert a force that brings things to you that you want. So if, you know, if I were, you know, we're doing this right, we could all concentrate on getting a million dollars or whatever, and indeed it would come. Uh, you know, and there have been a lot of attempts to explain this scientifically. For a while it was magnetism, that thoughts must exert a magnetic force that draws things to you. As we know, however, our heads are not attracted to refrigerators the magnetic force is, a, is so tiny that is exerted. By that. Now they talk about quantum physics. I love that. You know, at quantum physics, for some reason, are an ex, have become an excuse to mock all of science. See, there's nothing real, nothing true. And it, whatever you think, that's how the world is. So if you think positively, you remake the world positively, according to this uh, pseudoscientific explanation. But anyway, what's wrong with this? Why not delude yourself into thinking, you know, everything's fine and that you can change the world with your thoughts? And I have two problems with it. One, I'll, I'll be hard line about this. I think delusion is always a mistake. There's no safe delusions. Uh, although one of the messages of positive psychology in the United States is, yeah, it's good to have some positive delusions about yourself. I think the biggest evidence to that is the financial meltdown of 07. Now, a lot of things went into that, you know, like extreme class inequalities of the United States and, well, your country, too. Uh, you know, greed and uh, uh, an economy is based increasingly on finance rather than manufacturing or anything. But certainly one element was the grip of positive thinking in the corporate world and particularly in the financial sector. I mean, people who tried to raise problems in the middle of the last decade, would be shut up or fired. You couldn't be inside Countrywide Mortgage Company, uh, which was the, the one that it's almost single-handedly set off the whole collapse in the U.S., and say, I'm worried about our subprime mortgage exposure, or you'd be out. And I got to interview some Wall Street guys, very successful Wall Street guys, um, they, they said, this is just how it is. You can't, you know, people who tried, let's say, within Lehman Brothers to point out that, that the, the housing prices could not rise forever were fired. And so it was this willful ignorance. Nobody could think bad thoughts, nothing bad, and if you didn't, nothing bad would happen. And I think the other thing that I find very, very disturbing about it is I, think, I just think it's cruel I mean, it's, it's cruel to take people who are having great difficulties in their lives and tell them it's all in their head 
and they only have to change their attitude. And, I, you know, my favorite example of this moral callousness is from the author of The Secret. That was a bestseller here, too. I admit it. Uh, the book on how you can have anything you want, attract anything to yourself by thinking. And she was asked um, about the tsunami of 06 and how, you know, how could this happen? You know, and she, she said, in kind of paraphrasing, that those people, the victims of it, must have been sending out tsunami-like vibrations into the universe to attract that to themselves because nothing happens to us that we don't attract. And I, I, I think that's beyond amorality. I, I don't even know where to locate that. I'm not advocating gloom and pessimism or negativity or depression. Those can also be delusional. I mean, you can go around, you know, making up a story to yourself that everything you undertake is going to fail. Uh, and that's, there's no reason to think that. I might very radical suggestion is realism. Just trying to figure out what is actually happening in the world and seeing what we can do about those parts of it that are threatening or hurtful. I, my background is in science, and I think you know there, there's not one fixed truth or reality, but we're, we close in on something. And we, then we think, oh, this is as good as we can understand for now, you know, until we get better information, but try to act on that. I think I would make a case that we are hardwired to be vigilant. I mean, yes, we have many other capabilities, you know, to be jolly, to be experience camaraderie, solidarity, all of those great things. But we're also, we're hardwired to be vigilant and on guard. That's how our very distant ancestors survived. Uh, not by saying, oh, it's, everything's probably okay, don't worry about the motion in the tall grass over there. The people who survived said, move, it's a leopard, you know, let's go. George W. Bush. George W. Bush was a cheerleader in college. Not an athlete, but a cheerleader. And I think he construed the presidency as a continuation of that role. Uh, he, he is one of those people who closed himself in a bubble of positive feeling. Uh, Condoleezza Rice said uh, way too late uh, that she had had doubts about the invasion of Iraq, but she didn't dare express them because uh, the president hated to be around, quote, pessimists. See the equation of pessimism with doubt. So nobody, nobody raised any questions about that war within the hearing of the president. Or those that did, like the general who suggested that we were only putting uh, half as many troops on the ground as, as would be needed to accomplish whatever we were trying to accomplish, uh, he was pushed out of the way. He lost his, his job, essentially. What could be cleverer as a way of quelling dissent than to tell people who are in some kind of trouble, poverty, unemployment, etc., cetera, uh, that it's all their attitude, you know, that that's all that has to change, that they should just get with the program, you know, smile and, and get no complaining. You know, I mean, it's a brilliant form of social control, which, by the way, was practiced in the Soviet Union. I mean, one of the principles of Soviet communism was optimism. So it's a form of social control, by the way, that you know is quite widespread, has been widespread in totalitarian types of societies. But I think it has worked very well in America. Take the issue of class inequality. How could that be a problem if anybody can become rich by thinking about it? You know, if 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 any one of us can just attract wealth to ourselves, there's no issue. Somebody raised the, the a parallel to what we call market fundamentalism, right? You know. The idea that the market, the invisible hand, will straighten everything out. That you don't have to intervene, you don't have to have policies, you don't have planning, because there's this miraculous force that just irons out everything. Well, maybe a couple of generations get crushed along the way, but it's basically, I think it just, it, it's it completely overlaps with the positive thinking ideology. You don't really have to do anything because there is this benevolent, invisible deity, the market, that will clear everything up. And I, I, I tell people, you want to really take a mental leap, a sort of a kind of belief. Believe that we could change things. This is the, it's the powerlessness of positive thinking, because it always just thinks, it always just envisions you as a lone individual changing the world. Or not changing the world, redesigning the world to fit your ideas. But we do have strength, you, we, we do have power, we have collective power, which we could use uh, to make changes that would end a great deal of su unnecessary suffering in the world.